the current treaty holders of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land today. You may work and live in different territories, so we encourage you to reflect on the land in which you are located and to consider your relationship to the land and to the people who are traditional keepers of the land. Rounds is supported in part with funding from the Government of Ontario, from the Ontario Centres for Learning, Research and Innovation and Long-Term Care, Behaviour Supports for Seniors Program and Toronto Central Local Health Integration Network. So, Inat, I'm wondering if you could introduce a topic for today. Absolutely. Thank you for that opening, um, Stacy. Uh, I'm very excited about the topic for today, and thank you, everybody, for sharing some of your summer with us. Um, summer has a very refreshing feeling to it, and so we thought innovation would be a, a very good topic for this time. Uh, and uh, as a behavior support, um, in NCLRI, we always look for um, innovative um, uh, models and innovative um, innova innovations in care uh, and to get and to keep up to date with them and to bring them to your attention. That's exactly what we're doing today. We have three exciting uh, innovations to hear about that we could utilize with uh, um, older adults, but also with um, clients with dementia or responsive behaviors. Um, uh, some in direct support of the clients and some in support of their caregivers, which is such um, an important part of that dyad of care um, in supporting um, clients with responsive behaviors in all sectors, I would say. So um, I would love to introduce you to the first innovation that we're going to hear about today. We're going to hear about three innovations. The first one would be from uh, Kim Durst, who is with us. Uh, uh, she is um, a, 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 she is a, a therapeutic recreation coordinator at, at Breuer uh, Continuing Care. I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly, uh, Kim. And uh, she will talk to us about uh, cycling without age which is an innovative program that makes it possible for seniors, uh, especially those with uh, mobility challenges, to stay active and get back on bicycles, allowing them to enjoy a scenic, uh, 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 their scenic communities. And, and we know even from the perspective of the pandemic, uh, how important um, those activities are and, and the ability and out to, to have that outlet. So Kim, we're excited to have you today. Thank you for coming and joining us. And uh, uh, we would love to hear more about your innovation. We will um, uh, we will introduce the other innovations after the, your presentation. Great, I'm ready to start. So as mentioned, I'm Kim Durst McKenzie. I'm a therapeutic recreation coordinator at Briere Continuing Care, and I've been here. I'm in my 35th year, so I've seen lots of different things over the years and I have to say that this is probably the most exciting program that we have. Um, it's uh, we were talking earlier about talk about risk, uh, the fact that we can take people outside and get them to enjoy the fresh air. Um, it's a it's a great opportunity. So I do want to mention that I I would like to thank the Ontario Centre for Learning uh, research and innovation in long-term care that's been ho that is hosted at Residence Saint Louis. Uh, with their support, we've been able to do some of the data analysis, which helped us go forward with this program. So, cycling without age, uh, or in brackets CWA, this was something that we were introduced to back in 2016. So it was developed in Denmark by Ole Kassau in 2002, and it's a, a global activity. Uh, it's basically an opportunity for our long-term care residents to be active and maintain community connections. 
And this is done through our trishaws, our three-wheeled rickshaw bikes that are piloted by volunteers. Um, and you can see one person in the bike right now, but typically we can take out two passengers and there is a bike path or a bike pilot. So please note that when this started for us back in 2016, there were 28 countries around the world using this bike. And now as of March, 2021, they're up to 51 countries. We have over 3,500 bikes. Um, and just so that you know, there are 37 chapters of cycling without age across the country in Canada. In the world, there are over 2,500. So we have 10 in Ontario alone. And I think, um, I mean, I'll start at the bottom. When I think about this program, we were lucky enough to have it introduced to us by one of the our community members who lives close to our long-term care residents. He had been traveling in Copenhagen and happened to see one of these bikes. So he did a little bit of digging. So if you ever have 15 minutes of free time that you're scrolling through your phone, please have a look at this TED talk that was done by Ole Kassau. It was very engaging and I know I've watched it more than once because he tells the story best about the five principles, key principles of the Cycling Without Age program. The first one being generosity, generosity and kindness. Just the idea that this simple act of kindness of taking somebody out on a bike um, in the outdoors, it's a gift. Uh, the fact that they are cycling slowly through the environment gives them an opportunity to see, smell, sometimes touch some of the leaves as we go by in the bike paths, but also an opportunity to connect with our communities. The nice thing is that uh, when we do go out, you'd be amazed at the number of times that we do get stopped by people and start a conversation about the bike and about the home that we live in. There are also um, storytelling. That's an opportunity for the volunteer pilot to connect with the resident. They share stories. Uh, I'm always intrigued when a pilot came, comes back and says, did you know that Mrs. So-and-so used to work for Air Canada? No, we might not have known that, but it's an opportunity for them to talk about different things when they're out on the bike. With respect to relationships, it's really, really nice to see them develop in the organization. We rely on the volunteers, we rely on the nursing staff, we rely on families. There's all kinds of positive interactions that happen in order for the resident to get out on the bike. Without age, timeless. It's just an opportunity as somebody ages gracefully to continue to do things that they normally would have done in their lifetime prior to coming into the home. So those are the five key principles. And I hope that this works uh, well. We do have a two minute clip that shows you the program in operation. This is an AMI This Week Shortcut. I'm Dave Brown for Accessible Media. Cycling Without Age made its Ottawa debut this summer. The program, which allows volunteers to take seniors out on bike rides, is run by Briere Continuing Care. I met up with Director of Therapeutic Sports Services, Karen Lemaire, to learn more about this innovative program. It's about getting the residents here at uh, St. Louis Residence and the tenants at the village outside and enjoying the beautiful weather. It's a tool to connect the residents, the passengers, with the volunteer who's biking. Uh, it gives an opportunity for families to engage in a meaningful activity with their loved one and enjoy the, the outdoors at the same time. It all starts with a specially designed bicycle. Volunteer Gary Bradshaw first saw the bikes while vacationing in Europe. Their unique appearance caught his attention. It looks like a rickshaw. Uh, they call it a tri-shop. Tri uh, it's got three wheels. 
uh, one off the back uh, where the pilot or the volunteer uh, would sit. There is room for two people to sit at the front. Uh, there's a seat belt on it. So the people who are sitting in the front are strapped in. So it's open front. So you're getting access to fresh air uh, and really feeling the environment. Gary has seen lots of positive effects from the program already. The reactions that I've been getting after taking some of these people out has just been mind blowing. I'm a big believer that, you know what, you gotta give back to your community. As does volunteer, Michelle Cayouette. The main thing is the fact that people who spend all their times inside can go out and breathe fresh air. What I love is having people there enjoying themselves. For Accessible Media, I'm Dave Brown. Okay. Okay, uh, before I go into the evaluation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the program. So uh, we run the program with volunteers. The volunteers must sign a waiver form. They're registered in our organization and they complete uh, two training sessions. They do the general orientation as a volunteer and then we have um, a hands-on um, orientation that is done with the rider. We give them an opportunity to review the bike. We make sure that they're comfortable driving it. We do outings with nobody in the bike. We do outings with somebody in the bike. And once they pass and are comfortable piloting the bike, they're put on our roster. So um, they sign a waiver form. Our family members uh, receive a waiver form for their loved one to go out. And I guess as a final stage, it's the nurse uh, who's responsible for the day that determines whether or not a resident does go out. So when I talked about risk, I think of all the things that have gone right. Uh, we make sure that when they go out, that um, the, a safety check on the bike's been done at the beginning of each day. They go out with a binder. They go out with a cell phone with all the numbers that they need. Um, and then when they come back, uh, they are ready to take on a second passenger or a second trip for the day. So we typically have five trips a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, one in the evening. Each trip is an hour. And that includes the time that is spent going up to the room to pick up the resident. And people who are in a wheelchair are able to be met, to, are able to be lifted mechanically into the bike. So this has been something that's been very beneficial at both our sites. So now I'll talk a little bit about our evaluation. When we first started out, the hope was that we would get at least 20% of our residents involved in this activity. So in the very first year, we were lucky. Uh, we actually ended up with 26% that were going out. And each time that they went, the, the resident went out on a trip, the pilot had to do a pre and post survey. And they would indicate whether or not the ride was enjoyable, very enjoyable. Um, and the good news was that we had a very high percentage, not perfect. Um, we had, uh, I guess the common complaint was the ride was too short. Uh, we only had one or two people actually say they didn't enjoy wearing a helmet because it wasn't something that they had done before. And I think the positive thing is that um, the volunteer pilots, the residents and the family members talk a lot about the relational benefits that were enjoyed. And it was an opportunity for people to get outside and participate in an outdoor ride. The pilots for a little bit of exercise and the uh, participants just to enjoy the fresh air. Uh, this is just a picture. We had one of the pilots that um, used to go out with her, her mom. The resident didn't do much 
at the facility, but they would go out together and enjoy each other's company uh, on the bike. So that was something that was very, very positive. And I guess I'm just wondering if there are any questions for me. There's so much to say and so little time. Thank you so much, Kim. This was uh, uh, this is such a great and innovative uh, project. Um, I was just thinking uh, about all our 36 homes in the Toronto Central Region, and I wish we we uh, all those homes had a, had a few of those uh, all those bicycles. So please, if you have any questions for Kim, post them on the chat. Uh, we can also revisit any questions we don't get to right now um after we complete all presentations um as well but if there is any any questions specifically for kim please speak now or forever be silent or at least until the end okay, okay i guess so the one thing that i didn't mention was the cost um they're not cheap the bikes um they've been easy to maintain they are about ten thousand uh, dollars but we have uh, we were lucky enough to have support from the volunteer organization within our own uh residence saint louis volunteers that raised money through a couple of bazaars and also the village next door had a golf tournament so we were lucky to uh, have that paid for yeah, that, that's a great uh, comment and sometimes that's what it takes uh, to think outside of the box and do some collaborations. Um, and... Uh, um, Ina, we just have a... Speaks for itself. Sorry, we have a... We have a question? Comment. Um, yeah. So, Alison Mitchell says, great program. Thank you for sharing. I have wanted to do this for 18 years. It is time. Great. So you've inspired someone, Kim, today, and I, and I hope uh, uh, um, uh, more of our, our audience uh, as well. So thank you for the presentation. Please uh, stay around with us for maybe additional questions that will come up uh, later on. And also enjoy our next presentation. Our next presenter is Dr. Kelly Murphy, who is a psychologist at Bakerst Health Sciences and an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Toronto and holds an adjunct faculty positions at York University and Queen's University. Art on the Brain, she's gonna to talk to us today about Art on the Brain, uh, which is her own invention um, and is an affordable online recreation activity designed for all older adults, including those with cognitive decline. And um, uh, I've I've uh, I've seen your presentations before. I think it's 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 a great invention. Um, Kelly, please do take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Annette, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to showcase uh, Art on the Brain, which I think builds on the theme of accessible recreation for older adults. I'm going to assume everyone can see my slides. Uh, just going to roll through the disclosures, I do have the opportunity to receive royalties should Baycrest um, Health Sciences commercialize Art on the Brain. And I put this slide up because I wanted to um, make a special point of noting that it's this increasing recognition of the role of the arts in improving health and wellness um, among older adults that really inspired the, um, the innovation of, of this product. Uh, which is a web-based um, virtual recreation activity that uses visual art as a gateway for fun, cognitive, and social engagement. There are um, a number of unique features to Art on the Brain that I want to point out. Um, first, that it is um, the de design and user flow is informed by uh, cognitive aging and neuroscience that we have tried to um, capitalize on what is known about preserved thinking skills, um, offer an opportunity to improve intergenerational connections, uh, socializing, and as there's no special training required to use um, art in the brain, and we have attempted to accommodate for mild vision and hearing loss 
through um, audio-enabled capabilities and by trying to uh, maintain high contrast in the, in the visual display. Now, there are different ways you can engage with the product. You can play it with a partner. You can use it in a group. And you'll see a therapeutic recreationist um, using it with, with a group of older adults here. Uh, intergenerational interaction, as I spoke about earlier, as well as just playing it on your own. And I wanna just show you a little bit about what it looks like. Um, we're gonna jump into the application uh, from the gallery page here. And uh, from this point, um, I can select to look at the artwork of the day, featured exhibits, I can explore on my own. And what I'm gonna do is select to explore on my own um, and select a nature piece that I, that I really like called Water Lilies by Claude Monet. So I'll just kind of quickly show you the selection options. And once I, I do select a, a piece to explore, I'm gonna have the option of three different categories of activities. So I can select learn to learn information about the artwork and the artist. I can select play to engage with puzzles or storytelling games that are designed to reinforce my knowledge about the artwork. Or I can mingle by sharing uh, opinions and stories. So going to learn, I can read the curatorial content, history of artwork and artists. I can also um, play that and have it read to me. And I can select to make the, the piece bigger, just to have a closer visual inspection. And then in, if I move down to play, then I can select a word game or a visual puzzle game or a storytelling game. And all of these games are designed to implicitly reinforce my knowledge about the artwork, about the visual features and so on. If I wanna socialize about the artwork, then I can select mingle, where I'm going to be able to give my opinion about the artwork or post a comment or a story about it or simply view what other people are saying. Here there's a comment stream about how this piece is a mural on someone's wall and on somebody else has it on their umbrella. You may have wondered uh, who the little dog is in the corner there and that's our gallery guide, Ralph. And he can be activated at any point in the application where you can view a tutorial video where he'll come on and explain what you're doing and how to operate in that uh, feature of the, of the uh, program. You can also um, enable closed caption there when Ralph is talking to you. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what people's reactions to the product have been. Um, people tell us that, you know, I'm smart, I'm no longer afraid of art, um, that their opinion matters, Family have said it's wonderful to enjoy an activity together that has nothing to do with daily tasks. Kelly, I think you were uh, muted by the organizer because there was background noise. Maybe you could try and unmute yourself. Oh. Okay, so I'm back. Okay, as long as you can hear me. <laughs> um, so another thing we've heard from therapeutic recreationists um, just have to do with the fact that they've witnessed residents um, having more livelier conversations, people who haven't connected before uh, connecting around this activity. Um, even people who've, who've, known, who've been in the same uh, activities in the past, but just never really uh, had an opportunity to, to make that personal connection. We have published um, a research paper about the efficacy of uh, art in the brain in a long-term care setting. We trialed it with 31 residents 
And we were really trying to look at whether it was feasible, whether people would like it, whether the therapeutic recreationists would like it. Um, and we also wanted to tap into whether or not it could really influence um, a, an augmented or enhanced sense of well-being in the residents that had an opportunity to access the activity. And we were looking at things like emotional well-being, physical well-being, and cognitive well-being. And these different indices uh, were shown to improve um, in a vast majority of the participants that engaged with the product. So we were very encouraged to see that having this opportunity um, afforded uh, some improvement in personal sense of wellness among the uh, residents that were um, participating in the, pro in the opportunity to, to engage with art on the brain. Now, obviously, the most important thing is whether they like it or not. And we provided people with a series of statements about the product and asked what their level of agreement was. And um, what you're seeing here is if it's red, that they didn't like the product. If it's gray, they were undecided. But as you can see, looking at the graph, the majority of the bars are in green. And this is indicating a very positive response to the product, that they enjoyed it, that they would recommend it to a friend. Of course, we also wanted to see whether or not uh, people living independently in the community would also um, appreciate using art in the brain. And what we are very interested in when we when we start to sort of extend uh, the reach of, of these sorts of things is how much, uh, what are the attitudes towards technology? Do people have devices? Do people have access to the internet? And uh, in keeping with those trends, we had no trouble finding people who um, had had devices were able to to trial the product with with you really about one in three older adults saying um, that they are going online uh, daily to, to play games. So we wanted to look at um, a very rigorous study of the product by comparing users in the community who were accessing the product with other users who were trying other well-established um, virtual recreation games, um, as well as people who weren't doing any uh, uh, engagement with with virtual recreation. And what we found was that people who were using um, Art on the Brain liked it just as much as other products that were available. Um, but what we found that was different about Art on the Brain was that uh, the users did show some uh, enhancement of their well being after participating with, with, with the product over a better period of six weeks. And this was a change that we didn't see in our active control group, which was using the other virtual recreation uh, program or in people who were weightless controls. Another thing that we noticed that was unique to Art on the Brain was personality style seemed to have an influence and moderate how much people liked the product. So people who were more open uh, to experience tended to even like Art on the Brain more. And this um, relationship between personality trait and level of enjoyment with the virtual recreation activity was found in Art on the Brain only, not in the other recreation activity that we trialed. So we think that, um, you know, having a personal connection um, with the recreation activity, and I think uh, what you're seeing too with, with the um, with the cycling program is having that personal connection. That activity is, is, is affording a personal connection for the individual with their environment, with the, with the person that's cycling with them. And we find that art is another gateway to make those kinds of connections. And I'm just showing you this last slide here to just um, drive home that point because one of the comments we had from our users after using Art on the Brain was that they were sharing that experience around the dinner table with their son and his girlfriend and talking about a painting that they saw. And so um, the son and, and girlfriend said that they also loved the artist Dolly and they wanted to know which painting and they looked it up on their phones and this became something that was discussed among them and, and led to an enjoyable interaction. I want to acknowledge that um, I'm not, I, this is something that I was a, a co-inventor on um, we, uh, with, uh, together with Aviva Altschuler. We had a, a large team of researchers that have helped us uh, rigorously evaluate the efficacy of 
the product. And um, I also want to acknowledge the person that was helping with the content management and the museum partners. So we have five internationally renowned museums that have contributed artworks to um, to Art in the Brain, as well as the funding sources that have helped us out. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great, Stacey, I think you're the only one who can see questions from the entire audience, so do let us know if there is any comments or questions there. Um, I do have a, a question. Uh, first of all, this is, this is fantastic. I was reflecting as you were presenting um, on the past pandemic and how tools like that became so important um, in this past pandemic. And I, I guess a question for you, Kelly and Kim, if you could after respond also from your context uh, that I had in my mind is how the, the COVID pandemic impacted or interacted with your inventions and, uh, and how do you see the utilization um, of those invention inventions moving forward with that in mind? Do you want to go first, Kim, or? Uh, oh. Kim, I think you're muted. Kim, I believe you're muted unless I'm the only one who can't hear you. Yeah, sorry. Um, I must say that we relied heavily on iPads uh, throughout the pandemic and continue to do so. For the most part, it was connecting families with the residents at the very beginning. And as time marched on, we started to use them to do one-to-one -one activities with the residents. Some of our unit support staff were looking for music. They were doing puzzles. They played bingo. So I like, um, I wish I'd known more about this because it's uh, something that um, uh, we have a number of residents who would appreciate art and seeing it in this format. Oh, now you're muted, uh, Annette. <laughs> Me. Um, and so, but from the perspective, Kim, of Cycling with Age, were you able to continue the program throughout the pandemic? And uh... No, no. We were, uh, the organization, the international organization asked us not to go out. Um, so this is actually the first year, I don't know, one of my photos, it's probably the first one taken this year, where we're having one person go out with the pilot, and both are wearing a mask, and we have to make sure that it is, the uh, bike is wiped down the seating area each time between each ride. So. Last year was a bust, in my opinion. This year, we're we're finally getting an opportunity to go out. Good, and I'm sure that's much uh, needed relief. So that's yeah. great. We're able to to bring that back. Thank you so much, Kim. Kelly, as per your uh, art on brain. Yeah, I would just say that. So the re the the research results that I presented were all pre-COVID, uh, but since COVID, um, we've been um, part of a suite of products that are being showcased on Baycrest at Home. Um, and my understanding is from that it's been very well received from the folks that are accessing the program through that. And we've also been using it in-house in palliative care as well as you know, with our residents and the Apotex. Um, and that's been well received by the therapeutic recreationists that have been working with the clients. So we feel pretty encouraged and um, we're learning a lot actually because when you create a, a product, you're not really sure how the end user will um, create, creatively utilize it. And so it's been really rewarding to, to get feedback from the therapeutic recreationists that have used it. Um, for us to help us develop materials that might also uh, facilitate the adoption at other centers um, in terms of creative ways that they can implement it within their programming. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for this, Kelly. Uh, is there any questions, Stacey, from uh, other participants or any comments? Yes, yeah, so Gloria Lipsky asks, was having staff pilot the bikes considered? Kim, I think that's for you. Was having staff pilot the bikes considered? 
So uh, we do pilot the bikes uh, uh, rarely. So the idea is this is a program that we share with volunteer resources. We will pilot the bike to determine whether or not somebody is capable of going out with the volunteers, that there won't be any issues. Um, but for the most part, this is a volunteer driven activity. We spend, um, we have a good 20 pilots that are from all walks of life, but avid cyclists. We have RCM, retired RCMP officers, I think three. We have a school principal. We have a lot of local people. So they're very, very capable of going out and piloting the bike. So they use the bike more than the staff do. Kim, I really appreciated that pun there where you said it was a volunteer driven activity. Thank you. We we do all the we do all the coordinating and organizing of it. That's great. Anything else, Stacey, before we move on to our, our third and final innovation? So at this point, I want to thank Kelly and Kim. If you are able to stick around with us, we may have additional questions and comments for you later on. Uh, but it's my pleasure to move on and uh, introduce uh, our last speakers for today uh, that I also had the pleasure of working with is Dr. Robert, uh, Robert Mardan, Rob Madan. Uh, is a psychiatrist in chief at Baycrest and is involved clinica clinically in long term care consultation and outpatient psychiatry. And Dr. Ken Schwartz, who is a psychiatrist at the Baycrest Psychiatrist uh, Psych Psychiatric Day Hospital for Depressed Elderly. Uh, the Baycrest uh, Quick Response Caregiver Tool, which is the innovation they're going to speak about today that uh, they both uh, co created. Uh, was created to help caregivers and care partners respond to challenging behaviors uh, expressed by persons living with dementia. I know they uh, they can uh, demonstrate that by video, but I would say that I'm already familiar with this, um, and uh, this is already uh, um, being adopted by some of our clinicians in the community, uh, behavior support clinicians. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to uh, um, uh, Robin Ken that you are here today uh, to share it with, with everyone else. Uh, so please uh, take it away. Okay, thanks. Well, welcome everybody. Nice to, uh, nice to be invited to this, uh, to this event. So I'm, I'm Rob Madden. I'm the Chief of Psychiatry at Baycrest. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. And this is Ken Schwartz. Ken, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I've worked in many nursing homes over the years, including the Apotex. And, uh, you know, because of time, I'm going to let you go right into it, Rob. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, um, just very briefly, I'm going to give you a very quick two, two sentence um, synopsis of what it is, but I'm just going to show you the website and the video because I think it's pretty self explanatory. Uh, basically, this tool is something that caregivers formal or informal caregivers could use, and, and I would say should use, uh, right in the moment when they're uh, managing uh, a responsive behavior or a neuropsychiatric symptom. Um, so we, we have things like pieces, uh, uh, dice, or ABC. These are um, great frameworks to develop care plans and to give you a path, and, uh, and, and they, could, they should be used. This, this is something that could be added to the toolbox which would be used in the moment, which could be used on your on your handheld device, on a tablet. So I'm going to share the screen so that you can see. Um, you should be able to see that. And uh, Danielle, uh, sorry, Inat, can you confirm that you see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay, thank you. I can see it too. Thank you. So if you go to Baycrest uh, homepage and you go to education and training, you've got um, you've got a lot of resources here, um, <laughs> lots of different resources. Um, if you go to educational resources, we'll get more resources. Here is our clearinghouse for dementia resources. We have a whole section on responsive behaviors for caregivers. It's it's really a great thing. We put it together years ago and it still stands the test of time. 
Uh, so a, a very good thing, some stuff on late life depression. And here we are, uh, we have our Baker Rest quick response caregiver tool. So uh, also fast, Rob. Uh, Rob, perhaps we can also post the, the more direct link on the chat so people can save it and open that on their browsers. Uh, right. So um, can you do that or are you asking me to do that? We can do that. Myself or Stacy will do that. Yeah, I think I can. Hang on a second. Paste. There we go. I think I did it. Okay. Anyhow, uh, where was I? Yeah. So you, you end up on this um, on this page, a quick uh, response caregiver tool. You can download the tool um, and it, it tells you a bit about what happens, uh, sort of how to use the tool and um, teaches you the steps. There's five steps, carer, um, which you'll see. And every step it, you could open up and it tells you what to do. So I'll get back to this in a moment. We have instructional videos the first video talks about neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia uh, for, uh, for people to understand what you're dealing with. It's about eight minutes long. The rest of these videos are about three or four minutes long, and they're videos with standardized uh, people, uh, actors um, who are uh, using the tool. So um, we're going to watch this one here called No Pills, so you can get a, a flavor of, of what it's all about. In this next video, Stacy is a caregiver to her mother who has Alzheimer's disease. Stacy wants to give her mother some medication, but her mother doesn't want to take any medicine. Hi, Mom. It's time oh. for your pills. Hello, dear. It's time for you to take your pills. Oh, no, I don't want any pills. Mom, you have to take your pills. I'm sorry, I don't need any pills. You do need your pills. The doctor says you have to take the pills. I'm perfectly healthy and I'm not taking any pills. Why are you being so difficult? You do this twice a day. You have to take your pills. No, I'm not taking a pill. You that. have to take these pills. Come on, mom. I'm sorry, I'm not taking any pills. <sighs> Stacy tried hard to convince her mother to take the medicine and they both became very frustrated to the point that Stacy was pushed by her mother. No. Let's look at how this interaction might change when Stacy uses the Baycrest Quick Response Caregiver Tool. Hi, Ma. It's time to take your pills. Oh, hello, dear. I've got your pills here for you. No, I'm not taking any pills. What do you mean, Mom? You have to take your pills. I don't need any pills. Mom, the doctor says you have to take your pills. I'm perfectly healthy. I don't need any pills. Just, just give me a second, okay? I'll be right back. Stacy is now going to use the Baycrest Quick Response Caregiver Tool. Let's see how she does. Step one, calm down. I need some space to calm down. I'm getting so frustrated and things are getting out of control. Things will only get worse if I try to convince her to take the pills while I'm already angry. It's time for a break. Step two, attend to the interaction without immediately reacting. I have to remember that she's unwell and she's really not thinking clearly because of her illness. We're both getting upset and I'm sure that she isn't doing it on purpose. I have to pause and think before trying again. Step three, reflect on your own feelings. How am I feeling? I'm feeling frustrated and angry. Why? Because I just want her to take the medication. I'm also feeling guilty because she's unwell and I should not get angry. Step four, empathize with the other person's feelings. How does she feel? I suppose that she's confused about why I want her to take the pills. She said that she feels well, so why take medication? She's always been an independent person and never really liked taking medication. She's angry because she probably sees I'm not listening to her and I just keep trying to give her the pills. Step five, respond. I don't see any way to give her the medication right now. She's agitated. If I try even harder to convince her, things will get worse. I need to calm down and let her calm down too. I can always try again later and try it in a different way. The doctor told me it's not dangerous if she misses a dose of medicine. I can always call for help tomorrow. Ma, I can see you really don't want to take your pills. No, I don't. And I get the feeling that you're frustrated with me. Yes, you're annoying me. So, you know, let's not worry about the pills right now, okay? Should we do something else? 
One. Why don't we go for a walk? Fine. Okay, let me help you. Stacy realized that she was not getting anywhere by trying to convince Helen to take the medication. By stopping and using the Baycrest Quick Response Caregiver Tool, she was able to try a different approach that had a better outcome. Okay, great. So you could see uh, we have a, a variety of videos. Um, you saw no pills. Uh, there's one here where this man is, has vocalizations, repetitive vocalizations. There's one here where um, the same actor uh, uh, is looking for his keys, becomes very paranoid, misidentifies his wife. She becomes upset and he uh, punches her or tries to punch her. So if, again, it's, this, it's the same, the same uh, steps. So what you saw was um, some training videos that we've made. So we put together this page. This is the manual basically talking about this vicious cycle where the person with dementia is agitated and the caregiver is already overwhelmed, already stressed, becomes increasingly stressed. And then the person with dementia, their behavior, their symptoms escalate. And it's a vicious cycle because caregivers are already stressed and, and, um, and feeling, feeling um, burned out. So it, it, it teaches them about this, so does the video. It goes through the steps, it describes all the steps, and then the, the uh, uh, caregivers will then watch the videos and they can download the handy dandy pocket guide, which is basically a PDF of those steps along with the, uh, with the, um, uh, you know, the, the steps and all of that. So I'm gonna try and unshare my screen. Don't know if I can or can't. While you're doing that, I just want to add that uh, this model was first tried out, or a, a little bit more detailed model was uh, taught by myself to a couple of uh, nursing homes, and uh, it was to the nursing home staff. And uh, we used this a little bit modified model uh, for family uh, members of people with dementia. And we try to emphasize that sometimes the best we can do is not make it worse. And every relationship is involves two people. And hopefully we can be guided by self-reflection and trying to be guided by understanding, not quickly reacting, blaming, or, or judging. I, I just want to throw that in, Rob, while you're, yeah. Filling around, finding the slides. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna close that so you can see these slides. Uh, I'll just maximize them. Just to go through, we don't, we don't want you to uh, look at all the slides, just to say that We've got funding to, to develop the tool and to study it from the Ontario government, from the Ministry of Health, from the uh, alternate funding plan. And that's our disclosure, but no financial disclosures. Um, and uh, there's certainly no bias here. So the, the tool was studied and you could see, you, you know, you have the five steps. We, we tried this out in caregivers and um, we did a feasibility study um, and um, Submitted it for publication this morning, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get a positive uh, response from, from this journal. Um, mm -hmm. So we did a, a feasibility study. We ended up with, um, um, we approached uh, over 30 caregivers. We got 21 caregivers to use the tool. And we got, oh, was a, I forget how many, but a, a whole bunch of uh, healthcare professionals as well uh, to use the tool. Uh, so there were spouses or adult children of caregivers. They had to spend s some significant time with the person with dementia. And they, they were asked to use the tool and, and, and to well, first watch the videos and then to use the tool. And then we did pre-post measures, um, you know, um, self-rating personal health, geriatric depression skill, competency skills, um, and, really, and asked them a bunch of, uh, you know, survey questions to see what they thought about the uh, tool. Was it easy to use? Was it useful? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, were using, we, we ended up, um, and we did some focus groups as well. So, uh, sorry, individual survey questions. So we got narrative responses, so it was qualitative as well. So mixed methods. Um, the average um, caregiver's age was 66. And uh, you could see the number of years caregiving was about five. So these were not newbies. These were people who were already well into it. And um, healthcare prof providers, social workers, care managers, nurses, social workers, et cetera. Um, again, in the business for, for quite some time. 
And uh, we got positive results for the most part. Uh, people thought it had a good impact on caregiver compassion, that it changed interaction, that they learned something effective. And we just end up with lots of great quotes about the uh, potential utility. And we, we want to answer questions, so I don't want to go through this in depth. Um, uh, but suffice it to say that our our our, our uh, survey responses were very positive. Um, what one thing that that did come out, and I'll, I'll stop sharing here so we can see everybody. Um, but one thing that that did come out in the surveys was that um, if you are a very experienced caregiver and have been dealing with this already, it could serve as a reminder, but may not be as helpful as compared to uh, someone who's a new caregiver. Who, who hasn't been dealing with the responsive behaviors as much. Um, and we found the same thing with long-term care staff that, you know, those who, because um, uh, there was a previous study, but we've also been speaking to long-term care staff, uh, those who've been in the business and are have say, significant expertise, like let's say a behavioral unit like 4West uh, or TRI, uh, Big Crest, uh, TRI at UHN, um, you know, there's a, for them it serves as a, maybe as a reminder Whereas for new uh, people coming on board to this job uh, as a caregiver, whether they're family or professional caregivers, it has a, more of an impact. And you see what it is. It forces you to stop in the moment before anything escalates. And that's the key. You got to stop. So I do a lot of marital therapy. Dr. Schwartz does a lot of group therapy. So sometimes you need to self-monitor. There comes a point where you realize you're getting bothered. You need to stop. You need to calm down. Go through the steps. Reflect on how you're feeling and try to understand what the other person wants. Okay, that that's the you need to do that for any two-person interaction that it's maybe not going so well. Any yeah. two-person interaction, you and a teenage son, whatever, you and a spouse, you and a friend, you and your boss, whatever it is, you know. Sometimes you just need to stop and, and reflect. And that, that's where it comes out of that's that that literature. So um, we're planning to do another study in long-term care. Um, we're looking for partners, and that's in progress. Um, and we're, we're wanting uh, some feedback. We, we've shown this to a lot of, to some BSO teams already, at the Alzheimer's Society. And what we'd like to see, um, if there's um, sufficient uh, interest, I, I hope there is, that this would be part of the standard tools, uh, the, the standard learnings for uh, new caregivers um, as, as they approach the Alzheimer's Society or as are connected with a BSOT, CBSOT, that, you know, saying, here's your toolbox, and here, and this would be part of the toolbox that we really hope. It, does, it takes very little time to watch the videos and read the narrative and could have a lasting impact. So we don't have much time for questions. Any questions? Yes, so uh, Stacey, you could let us know if something comes up on the chat. Um, uh, I wanted to thank you for time third time is uh um okay so i just wanted to, to thank you both uh rob and ken for bringing this to everybody's attention i think the brilliance of this tool is its simplicity and exactly what you said that reminder of stopping and i think it's a good reminder not only for our informal caregivers but actually also for frontline staff um interacting um PSWs also in the community and long-term care, trying to provide care, being in a rush, um, you know, and then having to adhere to a schedule and many, many, many tasks, the ability to pause and stop and be present in a moment and say, okay, maybe I don't need to achieve that task. Maybe putting the emphasis on the relationship. So I really want to thank you for bringing that, not only great tool, but important message with it. Um, is there any questions? I know our poll questions will pop on the screen soon, but is there any questions to Rob or Ken or any of our panelists before we we close today? We have one question from Heather. Has there been discussion with Age Inc. to include this mnemonic in their GPA basics curriculum? Yeah. I'm unmuted now. Okay, sorry, I was muted. No, um, um, and maybe that's a good idea. Um, I'd like to con consider that. Um, and maybe, uh, Inat, maybe you could help me get connected. I'm not sure where I would. Uh, 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 absolutely, uh, absolutely, I can. That's a very interesting idea. Thank uh, you. 
but it also shows that uh, by the comment uh, that uh, people are buying in to the to the tool and can see its um, uh, applicability. So I'm only seeing the poll. I no longer see the speakers. <laughs> uh, but um, if there is no other questions, I really want to thank uh, everyone, every single one of our panelists. Uh, for uh, a great presentation, your creativity, your innovation, um, and those wonderful tools that you're bringing that we could all then use um, to better serve our clients, our mutual clients, um, with responsive behaviors or, or uh, seniors as a general population. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. We will send you uh, uh, the links that were shared. Uh, please do provide us feedback on the poll. We will also send to you a link. Uh, after the presentation, and if you complete it, you will also be able to access and download for yourself a certificate of participation. Uh, we will uh, reconvene next month with a special rounds. Uh, Stacy, do you want to quickly tell people what the topic would be? Yeah, so the topic is focused on trauma, and it is um, Christine Rego, who's going to be doing the uh, presenting, and it's on the it's on Truth and Reconciliation Day, September 30th. We will and focused on indigenous uh, in, indigenous uh, communities. Um, so that's going to be our September. It's going to be an unusual date. So stay tuned for more details. Thank you again, everyone. Take care. Thank you.